thank you for joining us online this morning. Some of us may be thinking, here we go again, as our church buildings are closed once more during this second national lockdown of 2020. Obviously, for some of you, this has been the reality since March, but we're all together this morning to worship our living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. As today is Remembrance Sunday, there will be an act of remembrance at 11 o'clock as part of our morning service. Some words from Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. We sing our first hymn, O God our help in ages past. Today in the presence of the living God we remember many who have died. We remember family members and friends who we mourn and miss. We remember also those who in world wars and in conflicts past and present have died in the service of their country. As we remember them we remember also the death of Jesus Christ the Son of God crucified for us. His death brings forgiveness to all who have faith in him his dying and rising bring eternal life and resurrection hope to all who believe in him. 
So in believing faith we hear these verses. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Almighty God, long-suffering and of great goodness, we confess to you, we confess with our whole heart our neglect and forgetfulness of your commandments, our wrongdoing, thinking and speaking, the hurts we have done to others and the good we have left undone. O oh God, forgive us, for we have sinned against you, and raise us to newness of life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God, who loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be our Saviour, forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the special prayer of the day. Almighty Father, whose will is to restore all things in your beloved Son, the King of all, govern the hearts and minds of those in authority and bring the families of the nations, divided and torn apart by the ravages of sin, to be subject to his just and gentle rule, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Before our Bible reading, we sing, There is a Hope.
Today's reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 3 to 11. Praise to the God of all comfort. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favour granted us in answer to the prayers of many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join together in declaring what it is we believe about God. Do you believe in God? We believe in God. He loved the world. He sent his Son to save us. Do you believe in Jesus? We believe in Jesus, God's Son. He loved us. He gave himself for us. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? We believe in the Holy Spirit. He puts God's love inside us. He brings Jesus into our hearts. This is our faith. We believe in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. We worship together online again today as we've entered a new time of lockdown. Uh, a new and challenging time with fresh trials. But we remember that God is the God of all time. It's his time. He is working his purposes out. We are in his hands. The psalmist speaks out of his experience. I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hands. And he challenges the people. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard. Power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. So let us heed his advice this morning and let us pour out our hearts to God. Heavenly Father, we remember today on this uh, particular Sunday, Remembrance Sunday, uh, particularly those uh, in past times uh, and today have faced and are facing conflicts. At this time of remembrance, we think of all those who have sacrificed so much for the peace and the freedom that we enjoy today. We thank you for those that gave their lives. We thank you the families that have lost so much that is, is precious to them. And we remember those who are in the front line of conflict today, in our armed forces, protecting us uh, in this world today. We pray for all those who have been affected by conflict of different sorts all around the world, those who have been driven from their homes, those who've lost livelihoods. We've all seen the pictures on the television of destroyed cities. 
and we pray for all those who are suffering in any way because of the tensions and conflicts in our world today. Pray for all those reaching out to bring comfort and help, all those agencies. And we pray, Lord, especially for peacemakers. We pray for the United Nations and other organizations. Pray for world leaders that they may seek peace and justice. And we pray for peacekeepers, especially those putting their lives at risk to maintain the peace and bring an end to the suffering. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. There's a war of sorts going on in our world today, a world war with the coronavirus. And so we cry out to God for those who are sick with the virus, praying for his healing. We pray for those who have been bereaved by the virus. We pray for the healthcare workers under such enormous stress and pressure, especially we know in our country. We pray for their protection and that the Lord would sustain them in their work of care and healing. We pray for the scientists and the researchers and ask that a vaccine may be found quickly, one that would effectively put an end to the fear with which we live at this time. We pray for governments, not least of all our own government with such difficult decisions to make. And we pray for our own land with all the consequences of the illness and now the shutdown. We pray for those in care homes, those who are isolated and alone because of their situations. We pray for our own community, for God's protection and provision for those we love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The greatest need of all is spiritual healing in our country today. So many have turned away and forgotten God and his truth. And so we pray for the church and its witness, for the leaders of our churches, our archbishops, Bishop Mark, Bishop Keith, for our local church leaders. We pray for our witness together. We pray that we may indeed be salt and light as we proclaim the gospel in our worship and in our daily lives. Lord, give us courage to share our hope and the peace we have been given. And especially, Lord, we pray for members of our church family today who can't get to worship with us now and are feeling cut off and isolated. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We are living in challenging and painful times. And we look to the one who alone can bring lasting comfort for ourselves and those we love. We think especially of all those we know who are suffering today, whether it be sickness or sadness or anxiety and fear. Lord, be to them all that they need this day and in the days to come. We pray for your Holy Spirit to fill us, to give us that patience, that supernatural patience that enables us to endure with fortitude and hope all that this life is bringing to us. Lord, we look forward to the end of time, not just the end of this crisis time, but to Jesus' return that day that has been promised, a day of judgment and vindication when all things will be made new. Lord, we don't, we can't know that time, but we have that sure hope in your word. And we have the powerful presence of the Lord to sustain us now as we live in the light of that expectation today. Lord, Lord, with Paul, 
we would remember that you have delivered us in the past and we declare our hope that you will continue to deliver us. Merciful Father, accept our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our next song reminds us, even in these troubled times of COVID-19, God is our strength and refuge. Let us remember before God those who have died for their country in war, those whom we knew and whose memory we treasure, and all who have lived and died in the service of mankind. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We, we will, will remember, remember them. them. Thank you. 
When you go home, tell them of us and say, for their tomorrow we gave our today. again as we look at your word together now on this Remembrance Sunday. Lord, help us to think of all those who have just given so much and yet, Lord, we pray might we find comfort in our time today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. During the Second World War, a German minister found himself imprisoned in Tegel Prison in Berlin, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He'd been involved with the resistance movement and his work within the Confessing Church in Germany had allowed him to travel as a privileged courier, so much so that extraordinary confidence was placed in him. But on April the 5th, 1943, he was arrested and on April the 8th, 1945, he was hanged at Flossenburg. During his imprisonment, Bonhoeffer wrote many letters written with an insight sharpened by personal suffering. On one occasion, July 25th, 1944, he'd finished reading the memoirs of From the House of the Dead by Dostoevsky and comments, I am pondering a good deal on his contention that man cannot live without hope and men who are destitute of hope often become wild and wicked. He goes on, it doesn't matter if that hope be an illusion. It's true that the importance of illusion in human life is not to be underestimated, but for the Christian, it is essential to have a hope which is based on solid foundations. So this morning, can I ask you to consider the question, the hope that you have, is it illusion or is it based on solid foundations? Bearing in mind that we sit this morning, yes, in our homes, in the presence of God. Today, many people in our country will not have known the reality of war or even the threat of war. But all will value highly the need for personal freedom as we enter another period of lockdown. Today, it is taken for granted and we should never forget the sacrifice of so many to ensure our freedom. But for one man imprisoned for advocating freedom, hope became a vital concern. So again, for what do you hope? Well, if I were to offer you the chance to map out your life, or maybe just map out the next month or so, I wonder how you would decide what to include and what to leave out. Perhaps on a personal level, you would include a close family at this time. Perhaps for some, yes, a safe job that would bring with it responsibility and a sure future. And of course, yes, we all value a good retirement package. But what would you leave out? A kind of hope not column. 
well, yes, I think we all find sadness really hard to handle. So not too much of that, please. And following on from that, well, minimal amount of suffering, no ill health, no loneliness, no poverty, no isolation. To put together a column of hoping for whilst avoiding the hope not list, it's not that difficult, is it? But if we're honest, the putting together of such a list has come about because, yes, we've experienced the harsh reality of life. And so hope has become a kind of light at the end of a tunnel, something to wish for. So is it wrong to hope for something better? No, of course not. But we return, don't we, to Bonhoeffer's observation. It can be an illusion or it can be based upon solid foundations. Let me just bring in another contributor to our discussion and it's someone who introduces us to Bonhoeffer's solid foundations, the Apostle Paul. It appears he often found himself in, well, humanly speaking, hopeless situations. And yet in his second letter to the church at Corinth, he tells his readers that despite his hardship, there is one upon whom he has set his hope. He says in chapter 1 verse 10, on God, on him, we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. It sounds to me as though Paul had found a saviour and so placing in his hope there was just very natural wasn't it? You see like Bonhoeffer Paul would end his life imprisoned and like Bonhoeffer Paul turns in his time of suffering to the God who will continue to deliver him. Two men from very different periods of history, two men recognised for their intellectual contributions to the debates of their day, two men imprisoned yet able to speak out about the certainty of the hope they had. Were they deluded? Could hope exist in such hopeless situations? Can hope exist in our hopeless situation at this moment? Our understanding, I know, of hope could be interpreted as wishful thinking. Is that what is being referred to here in 2 Corinthians 1? And Bonhoeffer's journals, were they simply wishful thinkers? Valid questions when you consider the seriousness of the claim. No matter how committed we are to making the hoped for list work, we know that life won't happen in that way. And then what? How do we make sense of suffering in our world, in our own lives? What will sustain us when our freedom is taken from us? Yes, even freedom to worship. Is Paul speaking of physical, physical hardships when he looks to God to deliver him? No, of course not. Although he does suffer physical hardships, no, he's identified a far greater threat to his life. Spiritual imprisonment. Perhaps we struggle with Paul's opening phrase as he begins to encourage the church at Corinth to experience the comfort of God. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. We struggle, don't we, because we rightly identify a dilemma. If God is sovereign, if he is in control, then why the need for his comfort in our troubles? Surely we could experience tr comfort without troubles. And then, of course, secondly, if we have troubles, surely we conclude that God is not very happy with us. So then how can it be possible to praise him? However you look at it, it seems a strange instruction to praise him. Unless I'm missing something vital. Well, can I suggest that Paul, rather than wanting his sufferings removed, actually takes them up fully into his life of worship because through them he'd come to experience the grace of God in new ways and that was why he said praise him because of his situation rather than finding God absent he was learning new things that caused him to shout out with praise here was someone who gave him hope 
yet another captive. Number three, Samuel Rutherford, Scottish minister, exiled to Aberdeen in 1636 and forbidden to preach in any part of Scotland. But he wrote letters to members of, members of his former congregation. And one letter that he wrote to Lady Kilross began with an admission that he had failed to realise God's presence in his isolation. He tells us, at this point, apologies for the English, but it loses something in a more modern translation. He says, I was loosing a fast stone and digging at the ground stone, the love of my Lord, to shake and unsettle it. But God be thanked, it is fast, all is sure. In my prison, he hath shown me daylight. And later in the same letter, he concludes, I see grace groweth best in winter. Let me say that again. I see grace groweth best in winter. For Samuel Rutherford, the hardship of isolation brought a fresh understanding of God's grace. For Rutherford, did God somehow owe him for his faithfulness, for his persecution? No. Samuel Rutherford then added to his letter to Lady Culross on December the 30th, 1636. He said, I am nothing behind with Christ. God's grace more than met any obligation that Samuel Rutherford may have had cause to raise with him. Samuel Rutherford, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the Apostle Paul, what was it about these men that allowed them to have a real and living hope in the face of overwhelming hopelessness? Answer, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 5, for just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. Let me say there's no suggestion that these sufferings were good in themselves. No, Paul was no masochist, but he was able to see his sufferings and trials in true perspective because he had discovered how able and willing God was to enable him to endure them, because he was able to view his sufferings in the light of the cross. If the Son of God should be subjected to humiliation and death, then it's to him, to him I must turn if I should have to face the same rejection. Paul is clearly suggesting here that God has a very high aim in our experiences of suffering. Through trial, he is seeking nothing less than to reproduce his own character in us. And isn't that what Rutherford and Bonhoeffer saw and we see in them? It is, of course, suffering that makes comfort necessary and appropriate. And perhaps it is unwillingly that we go to the cross of Jesus, to the sufferings of Christ for that comfort. And it is here. And I say it sensitively that we find ourselves contemplating the deepest suffering of all. And yes, as Christ's blood was poured out for us, so from its Calvary source, comfort. Like every other blessing of the Christian life, is outpoured to us. So it's there at the cross of Jesus we discover that suffering, so evil and apparently meaningless, in itself can have eternal significance for God gives it his own meaning it was endured for us by the Son of God for our blessing although Paul and later Samuel Rutherford and later still Dietrich Bonhoeffer did not find that God removed the element of suffering from their experience yet they did find him acting in deliverance this is not a contradiction Paul in this chapter is saying that the experience of comfort and strength came first, but that in due course it was succeeded by the deliverance. Rutherford saw this and wrote, I see grace groweth best in winter. For Dietrich Bonhoeffer, it was his solid foundation upon which he based his hope. Let me finish his letter from July 25th. 
1944. However potent a false illusion may be, the influence of a sure and certain hope is infinitely greater and the lives of those who possess it are invincible. Christ our hope. This Pauline formula is our life's inspiration. They've just come to fetch me for exercise, but I'm finishing this letter to make sure it catches the post. Goodbye. Three men who learnt the secret, Christ our hope. So why have I shared with you this morning these three men's stories and their writings? Because they lived during periods of persecution and oppression. And because during those times they turned to God. And can I say it was not that they suddenly found God, a phrase people use that implies God kind of plays hide and seek. No. They turned to the God who they knew intimately. They learned new things as God drew them nearer to himself. It is true in human life that the longer we spend with someone, the more intimately we know them. And the writings we have handed down to us tell us very clearly that adversity brought these three men so close to God. So today, as our thoughts are transported back in time to those years when life was sucked out of this nation, have we anything to say about our future hope? Of course we have. Christ, our hope in life and death. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, again, thank you this morning that as we've considered your word and as we've looked at the lives of these three men, we thank you for their confidence, that you are a God of all comfort. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to have you as our hope in these so uncertain days, that we might look to you daily as the one who draws near. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. After our service this morning, we are going to kind of meet uh, on Zoom, so please grab a copy, join us for a chat. Our final hymn this morning is We Rest on Thee.
peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. <laughs>